unusual slide here up above me. The reason for that is simply this. I want to start out with a little bit of a mental exercise, and uh, I want to challenge you to think about something. Not the uh, easiest place to start out with, but I, I want you to think of the very worst place you've ever been. The very worst place, maybe it's a situation, it may be a location, but maybe it's a situation in your life. I, I want you just to take a moment with me, and would you think of the very worst place you have ever found yourself? Again, it may be a location, a physical location, or maybe it's a, a given situation in your life. Maybe even today, you are there. Maybe it's a health crisis. Maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's a job loss or something happening there. Maybe it's a, an issue with the family. Maybe, maybe you're living in the shadow of a loss of a dearly loved one. Very worst place you can imagine. Now think with me too, beyond that place you maybe have never been, but what's the worst place or situation you could think of that you could ever be in? You haven't been there before, but what's the, what, what would be the very worst place, physical, a literal place, or a situation in which you could find yourself? It could be anything. For me, as a lover of history, my mind, I, I don't have to think very long before my mind rests or finds a landing space on uh, the wars, specifically the Holocaust and the concentration camps where much death and persecution and suffering, and as uh, those poor people were many starved to death, many incinerated, many faced different things, and uh, my mind quickly goes there when I think, what's the worst place we could ever find ourselves? What's the worst situation we could ever be in? And, and certainly there's a multitude of many others. In fact, I would say it this way, because sin has come into this world, there's a lot of bad places, isn't there? A lot of difficult situations. That we can find ourselves in a terrible place here on earth. Some here, you've been there during your lifespan. Others here are even now in a situation which you might describe as a terrible place. Pastor Henry, if you knew what I was going through this week, what I, what I faced, this situation, boy, it's, it's terrible. I wouldn't wish it on anybody else, and it's, a, it's just a terrible place. Well, I, I want to encourage you a couple, along a couple lines this morning. Number one, we are not alone. We're not alone in the presence of God, but we are also not alone in the reality that many other believers have gone through difficult, terrible situations, been in terrible places. The author of the little epistle before us here uh, this morning is certainly was true of him. In fact, as we think of Paul and as he writes this book of Philippians, he had already been in some many difficult places. The book of Acts is written not by Paul, but written by, we believe, Luke, and it details many different things. Uh, he, you remember that Paul was stoned and he was left for dead outside the city. How many of that, that happened to you this week? Okay. Not too many of us, right? There's another city. They were chasing him to put him to death. And the reality is he had to be let down at night by a basket outside the city walls. Other times he was beaten and thrown in jail. In fact, the city to which this epistle is addressed was one of those cities in which he was stoned and he was thrown in jail to await whatever judgment would come. In Jerusalem, Paul was uh, attacked by a frenzied mob and very angry, very mad. And they would have killed him if the Roman soldiers hadn't showed up to arrest him and put him in jail to save him from this frenzied mob. He was taken to the governor of Caesarea. He was uh, that case dragged on for about two years and two different governors that he came before. After that, he claimed the right of a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. And as he did that, you remember, he was put on a ship to go to Rome. <laughs> what happened to the ship? It was shipwrecked. It, it was destroyed. They had to swim to a little island there that was close by. And then, do you remember, they built a fire. They were warming themselves. And as, as Paul was gathering sticks, the Bible tells us he was gathering sticks as, in, as he went to throw the sticks on the fire. You remember what happened? A viper came out and bit him. Okay? It didn't just bite him. The Bible says the viper bit him and hung onto his hand. It latched onto his hand. I don't know about you, but I don't like snakes. And I sure don't want one hanging as an accessory. Amen? 
That's what happened. He went to throw those sticks on, and that snake was just there hanging by his hand, if we could put it that way. The Bible says it was there, latched on to him. In fact, the Bible goes on to say what? He had to shake it off. Now, I don't know about you, but the idea of having to shake off a snake to get it off does not sound like fun. It's not a great place to be. Do you remember the response of the people? The people of the island and maybe some of those who were shipwrecked with him. Luke and Acts records it well. In Acts chapter number 28, verse 4, it says this. And when the barbarians, those of the island, saw the venomous beast. That's what snakes are, amen, venomous beast. Hang on his hand. They said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Now, that is a strong statement, so let's put it into some modern terminology for you and I to really grasp or to say, okay, let's see what they were saying in a sense. Here's what they were saying, if we could put it this way. This man is suffering the judgment of heaven. Whatever gods there be, whatever there is, boy, he's not going to get away with it because he's a murderer, and the vengeance of the gods there in heaven, they're throwing their worst at him. Well, you ever feel like, heaven's throwing its worst at you you ever think that things happen in your life and you're like man i i don't understand why this is happening no one else seems to go through this i find myself in a terrible place i go through a terrible situation and man it just just feels like heaven's against me that's exactly what these people are saying to paul paul man you you shouldn't have got out of bed this morning in fact you you shouldn't have got out of bed a few years ago all that you've gone through and all that you've suffered and, and all that you have personally been tormented with. He was suffering more than others, it would seem. He was facing terrible things in his life. He had every reason to be a grumpy old man, amen? He had every reason to not be happy, to not have joy in his life. He had every reason, and it didn't stop there. Paul finally arrives in Rome, and he's there in Roman custody. He's in prison, and some believe to be four years. Some believe a couple different times, uh, obviously, there in prison. He's awaiting, awaiting the Roman leader's final decision about his case, and it is during this time that it appears that he's writing this book of Philippians. And uh, early on, the situation when he was in prison wasn't too bad. He was kind of like under house arrest and bad enough, but it was a little better. But at this time, when he's writing the book of Philippians, and also he's writing a letter to Timothy, when he speaks even in this letter of being in his bonds in prison, it is likely that he is in either the Praetorium there in Rome or another one called the Mamertine Prison. Both of these prisons were known and were not good, especially the Mamertine prison. In fact, one historian recorded the Mamertine prison uh, this way. The Mamertine prison could have been called the house of darkness. Few prisons were as dim and dank and dirty as the lower chamber Paul occupied. Known in earlier times as the Tullianum dungeon, its neglect, darkness, and stench gave it a hideous and terrifying appearance, according to the Roman historian Celeste. Here he is, unfairly in prison. He's just gone through the, some of the greatest trials you could ever imagine. He's in prison for what? Preaching Christ. Telling people of, of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for, so that everybody who believes in him could be saved and gain heaven and lose hell. And he takes that pen and quill. He has allowed some means to write. And so what would such a man write in a letter to his friends? He's gone through his shipwreck. He's, he's been attacked by a viper. He's been stoned and beaten. Uh, the cities that he's come to, to rescue with the gospel, they've rejected him. They don't want to have anything to do with him. Now he's been imprisoned in a great Roman prison that no one would ever want to be in. So what would he write about? In the midst of such dire circumstances, wouldn't most of us write of our own personal suffering and we, we tell others of what we are doing, the sacrifice, the cruelty of this world, the, uh, the attacks and the cruelty of our enemy Satan. Maybe we'd give others a rundown of the, all that we have suffered. We'd encourage them to be willing to face the same. If you and I were writing, maybe we'd write our last will and testament. Maybe we'd write out our own obituary. Maybe we'd put together an autobiography. Yet in the book before us, this little epistle called Philippians, that's not what Paul does. It's not the goal, the main communication of this letter to the believers at Philippi. In fact, there's a most unusual theme 
for a person who's in prison, who's gone through such terrible things. In fact, historians would tell us that he was probably there for another year before he was martyred. Many believe that he was beheaded at Nero's insistence. And yet, as that looms on the horizon... We find a man in prison who suffered more than you and I could ever imagine and dream. And he writes a little epistle to believers like you and I in a local church. And you know what his theme is? <laughs> it's joy. Joy. He says over 15 times he uses the word joy or rejoicing. Joy, rejoicing. You see, in spite of experiencing the most terrible events and situations, being the most terrible predicaments and places that this world could put you in, Paul has joy. And I don't know about you, but boy, that challenges me. The little things that I go through in life, the places I find myself, the situations that I face, and how quickly it steals my joy, how quickly that sometimes I'm not as happy as I ought to be. I don't have the joy of the Lord on display. Yet here's Paul. Risen maybe writing by the light of a small candle in a very dark and dirty dungeon. Maybe still shackled. Facing a likely death. Still, still bearing the scar of the, the fangs of that viper. His back not fully healed from all the beatings that he took. And uh, suffering in many ways that you and I could probably never imagine. And yet he speaks of joy rejoicing in that situation that he finds himself in it would do us well this morning to hear of the source of the joy of paul because though the calendar changes those centuries come and go generations rise and fade may i just encourage you this morning true joy can still be found true joy can still be found so where do we find such a unique joy that stands the test of terrible places, of difficult situations, that it's still consistent and always there in spite of no matter what falls out in our lives? Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 1 with me. We see, we get a glimpse into what Paul would say. Notice it, Philippians 3, 1. He says this, and I like the, the finality to it because he says finally, right? Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, here's what he says. Rejoice in the Lord. And as if that wasn't enough, we turn a chapter later, chapter 4, verse 4, we see it repeated two more times in the very same verse. You know it well. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Can I just tell you, you know it well, the source of his joy was the Lord. His command is simple. Uh, the Holy Spirit telling you and I, here's the simple command for every day. Now, tomorrow, in the future, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now let's understand what that means. Just a few weeks ago, we had the privilege of recognizing several of our high school graduates here on this platform. Now, the high school graduates, they had a graduation party, and they, they had a good time together, no doubt, and, and celebrating a great accomplishment. And we rejoiced with them. They ought to be filled with joy. Those seniors here ought to be filled with joy. That's a great accomplishment. And so we rejoice with them appropriately. And as is the case in Michigan, these graduation open houses carry out the rest of the summer. Amen. And so some of you may have done some yesterday. Some of you may have done some other times and so forth. It's a time of rejoicing over an accomplishment, over something that's done. Now, let me ask you this. Yes, okay, I graduated in 1993. That's 30 years ago. Many of you, yes, yeah, somebody just whistled. Thank you for calling me old. God bless you. Okay, some of you graduated a lot longer time ago than that. How many of us we pull out our diploma and like, hey, 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 look at this? How many of you you graduated 30, 40, 50 years ago? You had a graduation party this past year. No one. Yeah, you had a graduation party this past year for 30 years ago. Probably not. Why? Why, why don't we keep having graduation parties? Why don't I bring up my high school diploma and every graduate recognition, every graduate that ever graduated high school, why do we do that? Why? Don't miss it. We rejoice in those things no longer because they're in the past. They were accomplishment for that time, and they were a great accomplishment. And you may pull out that diploma and say, oh, that's nice. I, 
I go, maybe you have it hanging up somewhere. You walk by, but, but you don't have a graduation open house every year to graduate or to celebrate your graduation 30 years ago, 40 years ago. That's in the past. But Paul says this, rejoice in the Lord. But don't miss it. He's saying rejoice in the relationship you have with the Lord. Can I tell you right now, if you're saved today, it wasn't a one-day thing. It is a lifetime thing. It wasn't a one-time accomplishment. It wasn't one and done. It isn't just in the past. It is in the present. It is in the future. And so Paul says, let's rejoice in the Lord. Let's rejoice in the reality of what you and I have. Those graduations, they're done. They're over. They're complete. But not so with the relationship we have with Christ. May I just put it this way. From the moment we first enjoyed the joy of our salvation to this very day, we get to rejoice in the greatness, the goodness, and the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ became my joy when I was six years old. And may I tell you right now, this morning, Jesus Christ is my joy as we gather here. Now, I sure am thankful for America. I sure am thankful for July 4th. But I'll tell you, my friend, my ultimate source of joy is not America. It is not any holiday. It is Jesus Christ, my Lord. This past week, do you realize that as you got to talk with your Heavenly Father, you got to talk with Jesus Christ, you got to read His Word, you got to spend time with Him? We had joy with Jesus Christ. We rejoiced in our Lord. We prayed, we talked with Him, we spent time with Him this week. We read his word, and we serve a Savior that ministers to us on a daily basis. The joy is consistently experienced. It's consistently, or is to be consistently expressed. Paul, in chapter 1 and verse 25, he calls it the joy of faith. And he tells us why and how Christ is to be our rejoicing every day. Don't miss it. Paul's writing to us, and he's saying, listen, I've gone through all these things, and Acts tells us what he experienced. He's gone through the most terrible situations. He's been in the most terrible places, and yet he says, listen, every day I have joy. When I wake up in this cell, I have joy, a joy that the world cannot offer. May I just say this? You wanted this message to pertain to July 4th? Here's how you can pertain it. America is joyless. America is no longer a happy nation. Because they do not have Jesus Christ. We do not look to the God of heaven. We do not look to Jesus Christ, our Savior, as a nation, as an entire entity. My friend, you as a believer, we have the privilege of knowing the ultimate source of joy. And to experience it every day. To enjoy the relationship that you and I have with the God of heaven through the Savior of the cross of Calvary. So my friend, you say, how do, how do you enjoy that? Well, Paul would use this epistle to say several things about how do we experience practically on a daily basis and how do we rejoice in our Lord. Well, uh, studying and so forth, I came across a great outline used by the old preacher H.A. Ironside. And I like the outline that he put together. Notice it real quick. Just a short outline within the bigger outline is this. Number one, Christ is the believer's life. This is described in chapter 1. It's pictured best in verse 21, right? Paul said what? For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Christ is the believer's life. He's our all in all. And when he is such, you enjoy the joy of the Lord. I'm reminded, we'll speak of it here in a moment, but I'm reminded the psalmist said that the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Paul, how are you getting through prison? Paul, how are you experiencing all of this? The joy of the Lord is my strength. I rejoice in the Lord. What are you rejoicing in? He's my life. He is my everything. He is my all in all. I would not have life without him, both physically and spiritually. He's my all in all. Number two, he is, Christ is the believer's example. This is shown to us in chapter number 2. It's summed up in verse number 5. Well, you remember what verse 5 says in chapter, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He is our example. He is the pattern I can follow. Uh, number 3, Christ is the believer's goal. This is described in chapter number 3. It's presented particularly or specifically in verse number 10. Remember what that says. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings. That I may know him. He is my ultimate goal. You say, what do you want to accomplish in this life? I want to know my Savior. 
I, I, I want to know my God. I, I want to walk with him. I want to have a relationship that thrives. I want to know my Savior. Number four, Christ is the believer's strength. We heard a little bit about this on Wednesday. It's described in chapter 4. The central verse is verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, through Christ which strengtheneth me. He is my daily strength. So I rejoice in what he is to me. Now, would you think on these four things? Would you contemplate them with me? And would you think about what Paul presents to us in this letter? Paul had a wide variety or an array of experiences in his life. And what he is saying is this. You know, no matter if I'm in the cold, dark dungeon in Rome, or the, the prison at Philippi, or the, the, the multiple of other prisons that I found myself, whether it was after laying in a prison, hardly able to move, my, my back bloodied and bruised from the beatings, whether it's sitting around that campfire after I already experienced a shipwreck, but also being bit by a viper, or whether it's sitting in the home of a believer, enjoying a meal together and we're singing praises around the table and, and we're praying to our God and the warmth of that room both in the, the fire that's maybe in the hearth and, and the reality of the, 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 the camaraderie the, the believers gathered together as Paul would have done and they read the word they t spoke of God and it does not matter any of those places Paul says I, I have rejoice I find joy every day in those places, in those situations, because my joy is in Jesus Christ. See, the statement is this. Paul says, he is my life. He is my all in all. He is the reason I live. He, is the, he gives purpose and meaning to life. He says, he is my example of how to live. And so I strive to emulate him. I follow him every day. And just in following Jesus Christ, it brings me joy. Just in following I made the mistake this morning of, of going into the nursery. I was looking for Erica. I made the mistake, and Miss Julie was there. I made the mistake of going in there and asking Miss Julie, hey, is Erica here? Well, there happened to be a small little one-year-old down on the other side. I couldn't see him. That's my son, Reed. I couldn't see him, but he heard me. And you know what he did? He started crawling for the door right away. Julie's like, oh, he saw you or heard you. And so I booked it down the hallway. Because he wanted daddy. Daddy didn't, couldn't do it right now. And as I went down the hallway, you know what I heard? Him starting to cry. Why? Because he wanted daddy. He wanted to be with daddy. He wanted to spend time with daddy in this moment and so forth. Did I tell you? You know what Paul's saying? He's my life. He's my example. I want to be with him. I want to spend time with him. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And no matter if I'm in a dark, cold dungeon or whether I'm in a home with fellow believers, the reality is I sure am thankful that I have Jesus Christ. And so I can rejoice in him in any situation, in any literal place. I can rejoice in the Lord and I can have joy. He is his daily, excuse me, let me back up. He is the ultimate goal in this life and next. To know him, to be close to him. To make this relationship with him all it can be. That I may know him. And I want to grow, I want to grow in my knowledge and understanding of Christ. My uh, fellowship of him. Putting his example into place in my life. He says he is his daily strength. When Paul was going into that shipwreck. You remember the angel stood by him the night and. He then proclaimed to those who were with him on the ship. He said, listen, don't worry. This ship's going to break apart. I'm like, those things kind of don't go together. He said, oh, no. God, God sent an angel. He said, he said he's gonna, everybody will be saved. Everybody on this ship will be saved. It'll be okay. And, and to go through the shipwreck, to face all that he's faced, how, how, does you, how do you do that? Well, can I tell you, you don't do that in human strength. You can only do that in the strength of the Lord. And so he said, he's my strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I, I can't do it on myself. I, I have no ability. I'm weak, but he is strong. I can do anything through his strength that he imparts to me. Whether that be the day that he stood before Nero, whether it was the day that he was all alone in his prison cell and no one came to visit him, visit him excuse me. No one, maybe the guards didn't even bring his meal. He was left all alone that day, too. God was a strength. 
or the day that he spoke before hundreds, maybe even thousands, and preached the gospel in some of these towns, in some of these cities. That day, too, Jesus Christ was his strength. Do you see these things here written above me? These things were true for Paul. Hence the reason there was joy in his life every day. He's rejoicing in the Lord. And it begs the question this morning, are these things true for you today? Are they true for you today? Is he your life? Is he your example? Do you, do you strive to follow him each and every day? The teachings that we find in the word, uh, certainly the gospels and all that Christ gave us as an example. Do you emulate that regularly? Is he your goal today? I get sick and tired. Listen to me carefully and let me be kind about this. But let me say this. I get sick and tired of hearing about the American dream. Because the American dream has turned into a nightmare. The American dream offers nothing. But I'll tell you right now, the Christian hope that we have in Christ offers everything. And so, my friend, can I tell you today, you ought to make not get, getting the American dream, achieving everything that, that uh, the uh, consumerism and everything else puts in front of us. There is no fulfillment. There is no contentment. There is no joy in those things. It will only be found in Jesus Christ. So make it your goal in this life to know him. To know him. Know the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. Know him. Is your mind fixed on these things? Do you meditate on him instead of your terrible circumstances? Is he your daily strength? Or do you get so consumed with your circumstances and the places you find yourself in? Or do you meditate on these things? Such joy grows and spreads to other things too. Here's what's neat about Paul. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord. And so he's an example of that. He does just that. But that's not all he joys in. Because he loves the Lord and he joys and rejoices in the Lord, there's something else that he rejoices in. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. We look here. We'll look at a couple different passages from the entirety of the book. First Philippians, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Jump down to 12, verse 12. Look at verse 12 through 14. Paul writes this. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, his imprisonment and other things, have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Jump with me to chapter 2. Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 2. He says this, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Jump down to verse 17. Verse 17, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. What does Paul present as the next step of his rejoicing? He rejoices in the Lord, but there's an extension of it or the next step is this. Don't miss it. He rejoices in the Lord's will and work. He is rejoicing in the Lord's will and work. In verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul calls the believers at Philippi his joy in his crown. His joy and crown. He rejoices in them uh, standing fast in the Lord. In verse 10 of the same chapter, he says this, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. So what do all of these verses, chapter 1, all the way through the uh, verse that we just shared with you after chapter 4, what does it show us? Well, Paul's doing something. What is he doing? Well, he is rejoicing in the fact that the will and the work of Jesus Christ is being accomplished. He's rejoicing in the will and the work of Jesus Christ being accomplished. This is what he's, I love Jesus. I rejoice in Jesus Christ. Therefore, the natural next step is to rejoice in the will and the work of Jesus Christ. 
whether it be the believers there at Philippi, their own personal growth. He says, listen, man, I rejoice to hear that you have the same love. You are like-minded. You're doing these things. Ah, that just thrills my heart. I have joy that God is doing these things in your midst. Or whether it's that Christ is being preached simply because he's in prison. Others are waxing confident without fear to preach the word. They are going out and sharing the word. That, that there are many in the palace and other places that are getting saved. Paul is saying, man, I, this is exciting. Woo! God is blessing. He's working. His will is being done. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Paul said, man, the will of God is being accomplished. In the palace of Nero and other places, God is accomplishing his will. He's doing his work. See, Paul is still all about rejoicing in Christ, but he's also all about rejoicing in the will and the work of his Savior. You cannot, now do not miss this today, you cannot fully rejoice in Christ without rejoicing in his will and work. You cannot fully rejoice in Jesus Christ without rejoicing in his will, in his work, what he's accomplishing. If you're consistently and truly rejoicing in Christ, you can't stop and re from rejoicing in what brings him joy. People being saved, things happening, the ministry happening. But Paul, you're in prison. Paul, you suffered so much. You're, you've been shipwrecked. You've been beaten. You've, you've, mobs have attacked you, left you for dead. Paul, you're facing certain death. You've been through so much. And yet, when we read this book, those are not the meditations, the thoughts of his mind and heart. Now, don't miss this. His mind and heart are not occupied with his situation or the place where he is. Rather, rather than being preoccupied, his personal situation, his seemingly dire future, the disappointment of not being able to take more missionary trips. Even in this letter, he writes, I'd love to come to you. I'd love to come to you. Many others, he writes, I, I'd love to come to you, see you again. He has chosen not to think on those things. What has he chosen to thank God? Well, he's chosen to rejoice in the Lord in spite of his current circumstance. Where he finds himself, what he faces, what's going on around him, he has chosen to rejoice in spite of that. Can I just give you a simple reminder of something that I, I, I think we all, myself included, we all sometimes forget. Situations will come and go. Situations will change, but Jesus Christ does not. Jesus Christ does not change. Circumstances will. Now, often the things of life we find ourselves in, situations and places, we think they'll last forever, but it's just not true. We find in this letter a believer that is all about rejoicing in what God is doing. He's rejoicing how God's will has played out, how it's being accomplished, how the work of God is being carried on in spite of his own difficult circumstances, in spite of himself being in prison. He is still rejoicing no matter the dire situation he finds. He's rejoicing in the Lord. May I ask you today, have you been doing that? Are you rejoicing in your situation, in your circumstances? Oh, they may be terrible. There's no, there's no argument there. They may be the worst that you could ever imagine. They may be a very difficult, hard place to find yourself in. But are you rejoicing in the Lord? Are you still rejoicing that even in your difficult situation, God can be glorified, his work and his will can be accomplished and done? There's one final thing I believe the Holy Spirit would have us to see this morning, and we'll do so quickly. But here is the helpful, practical truth. Here's where the rubber meets the road for you and I. It's simply this, number three. We are encouraged to rejoice in the Lord. We are challenged and commanded to rejoice in the will and the works of the Lord. But maybe we also see this morning that rejoicing in the Lord opens doors. Hey, this morning, if you had five minutes, five minutes to sit down and talk with Paul. We put two chairs together. He sat in one, you sat in the other. Five minutes, what would you ask him? What would you ask him? What kind of question? I don't know about you, but first thing I would say, can I see your hand? I want to see where that viper bit you. I'd like to tell me a little bit more about it. 
But somewhere along the way, you know what I think most of us would ask? Paul, this life you've gone through, all this experiences, what have you learned? Paul, what have you, what's the number one lesson? I like asking people sometimes those kind of things. What's the, what's the one more thing you've learned? Or what's the thing that you took out of it? Uh, what, what have you learned? Well, interestingly, Paul answers it, doesn't he? Look at Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse number 10 and 12 through 12. It says this. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now, at the last, your care of me uh, hath flourished again, wherein ye were all so careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, notice it, for I have learned. In whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, lowered, and I know how to abound, to be exalted. Everywhere, everywhere, every single place, everywhere, and in all things. That's every situation, that's every circumstance I find myself Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full, content, and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Whatever state, what, hungry, not hungry, abounding, suffering, I am content. Now, I love this statement. He says what? For I have learned. He didn't come by it naturally. This is a very transparent disclosure by Paul. He said, I want to give you a glimpse into my life. I, this is something I've had to learn. Okay? Some of you adults, okay? Let's say people over 40 like me. How many of you had to learn how to use a phone? How many are still learning how to use a phone? Amen. Updates after updates after updates, right? Now think about it. That's what Paul's speaking of. This is something I'm learning. It's not a one-time learning. It's not a one-time, no, no. When I, when I woke up in, in that boat and I knew shipwreck was coming, I, I was still learning contentment. When I knew they were going to beat me back in those city, when I had to be lowered down outside the wall of the city on a basket, I was learning contentment. When I was sitting in this prison for ongoing a year, two years, three years, I was learning contentment. I have learned. Didn't come by it naturally. He had to learn it. Do you realize that is a great picture of what the Christian life is all about? We have not arrived. We are still growing. We are still learning. New situations come. I find my place myself in a new place like Paul did. I am learning. I am learning. I am learning. I am learning what? Well, Paul st speaks of it here. He says to be content wherever he is and in the face of whatever comes. Now, some of you today, you need, a, you, you need a reboot. You need to reset your goal in life. You say, listen, I, I need to work at learning this lesson. I, too, like Paul, need to, need to say, you know what, God, I, I need to work on being content wherever I am and whatever I face. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what the next week holds. I don't know what next year holds. But, Father, I need to, I, I need to be content. Would you help me to be content whatever, wherever I am and whatever I face? But I don't want you to miss this this morning because I'll tell you, this just spoke volumes to my own heart. Not only did he learn the lesson of contentment, but Paul would go on and he has displayed it for us, the how of contentment. How does a Christian go through that? How does a Christian face that? How does the Christian maintain joy and happiness through that? Paul learned it. That's what he imparts in this small little book. My friend, today, this, <laughs> the how of contentment ought to be a challenge to us and, and ought to be an encouragement all at the same time. You say, what is that? What, what, what is the how of being content in every situation and every place? It is simply this, what we've already stated. You have the proper source of joy in your life. It enables one, enables one. It opens the door to be content in any given situation. See, when your joy is not found in your bank account, 
when your joy is not found in your circumstances, when your joy is not found in possessions, when your joy is not found in having the perfect job, the perfect house, and, and everything that you want, when your joy, that is not the source of your joy, but Jesus Christ is the source of your joy. When you rejoice in the Lord and the will and the work of the Lord, my friend, you can have contentment in any situation, in any place. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know each and every per one person's here's health situation. I don't know what tomorrow holds for you. But here's what I do know. If you will make Jesus Christ your joy, you can face anything with contentment. You can be content. Each one of us can. See, the Holy Spirit is teaching you and I today through Paul. That rejoicing in the Lord, it certainly brings God glory, but it does something great for you and I. There is a byproduct of rejoicing in the Lord for you and I. It opens the door to be content in any given situation, any circumstance, in any place. We might say, if we would put it such a way, this is the key to Paul's contentment. How is Paul writing a book where the theme is joy? Where he's gone through such terrible situations, he's in the most terrible, heinous, uh, uh, ugly, disastrous place, the prison in Rome, and he's writing about joy. Here's the key. He has found the ultimate source of joy is Jesus Christ. He can face anything. He can be anywhere. You know, sadly today, and as we bring it to a close, there's many people in fact, I would say many Christians who falter in contentment in their daily life. Why is that? Well, Christ ceases to be the source of their ultimate joy. They no longer rejoice in his will and work, and therefore then they are discontent in lives and circumstances. Relationships, job, financial situation, they're just discontent in it all. They don't know joy and happiness. You know what the saddest part about that is? Do not miss it. The saddest part is that God has given us everything we need to be a very joyous and happy people. We have Jesus Christ. So can I ask you this morning as we head into the invitation, would you answer honestly before the Lord and before the Holy Spirit? Number one, is joy missing from your life today? Is joy really missing? The down deep joy that, that uh, goes through every circumstance and every situation, is it missing? Ha have you ceased in rejoicing daily in the Lord? He's your life. He's your example. He's your goal. He's your strength. Have you stopped rejoicing in those truths? How about his will and his work? To hear someone get saved, to hear of things that God is doing, to, to know that God's will is being accomplished. It doesn't excite you anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't thrill you anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't do much for you anymore. And then let's make it very practical this morning. Are you content where you are with what you're facing today? Across the board, in your life, are you content with where you are and what you face today? Hey, can I just give you an insight, okay? Those of us who preach, Pastor Aaron preached last week, Pastor Tony did too. Hey, we are people too. I believe the devil knew exactly the message I was going to preach today. Because we loaded up the family in our car, and guess what? My car didn't work. Isn't that funny? You're going to preach on contentment and your car doesn't work. It'd be easy to get upset, wouldn't it? I mean, I was tempted to. God, I'm just trying to serve you. We're just trying to get to church got so much to do we got all this to do why won't the car work God, why, why? are you content whatever you face where you find yourself but th this is the day-to-day -day practical living of the christian life we all face it so let's step back this morning let's just say you know what am i really content no matter what happens no matter what i face where i find myself am i content and i'll tell you this message is all about good news because here's reality you can be content just start rejoicing in the Lord. Get back to rejoicing in Him. And you will find it opens the door to contentment.